Hello all, Old Geek here, and after all the nerdery on show the first time I looked through a, uh, a Dragon Magazine letters page, here's the second one. Of course, the letters page was called Out on a Limb, and it didn't appear in issue 4. So, issue 5 was the next time we saw the letters. And one good thing about that is it gave people time to reply to the letters from issue three. And I can see that already. Because the first letter on this letters page is a response to Lewis Pulsifer. If you remember, Lewis Pulsifer wrote a really, really long and very nerdy letter about elves which was published in the first uh, first out on a limb so our first letter is from a Garth Wilcoxon and he is replying to Lewis sirs in partial response to Mr. Pulsifer's letter October 76 I really cannot see what his problem is. He himself acknowledges his debt to Stith Thompson for many magical items and wilderness episodes, so when he states that fiction is a total waste of time, it leaves me wondering. Now, I agree with his statement that one could probably find better material elsewhere, yet if the Dragon ceases to publish these stories, many new writers would be left out in the cold. After reading his letter, I don't think that Mr. Pulsifer would object to that at all. But in doing so, he's actually cutting his and our collective throat. Just how does he think that all this got started? Yet allow me to regress for a moment in order that I might elaborate on this point. To begin with, Mr. Pulsifer seems to have forgotten that one of the most fundamental rules of existence, namely that you have to take the good with the bad, not all, perhaps none of these writers are going to be Mallory's or Tolkien's, but one should still give them a chance at least tolerate their efforts, in the hopes that they might one day achieve that higher plateau of artistry. For these are the people that enable the genre to survive. I think that Mr. Pulsifer should be thankful for them for enabling him to stand upon that height of literary excellence from whence he dispenses his wisdom. But how, you may ask, do they enable them to do so? Why? By being the pile, of course. Perhaps Mr. Pulsifer has forgotten just who he is standing on. But then, pure air always was a little thin and as such, liable to go to one's head. I thought Pulsifer's letter was the one about elves. I thought it was somebody else who was complaining about all the fiction. Maybe my memory has... that... let me down there. That wouldn't be... wouldn't be... Uh, unexceptional. And here, here, says the Ed. OK. So the ed editor, Tim Cass, clearly likes the fiction in the magazine. Dear Mr. Cask, I would like to tell you that about the massive campaign that I've been working on. It is situated on the hypothetical world of Lura, a world of infinite possibility and fantastic adventure. Although it is not our own Earth, it is only about 11 light years from our world, and therefore most of the culture is a parallel of our ancient cultures. However, the scope and size of the campaign is so much that I cannot create and run it all. They're, they're more. They're more? I am putting on a national it on a national basis so as to get the entire campaign running. I need 55 dungeon masters with time and good judgment who are willing to run an area about 600 by 600 miles. Each DM would gather up about 20 players, fill in any needed terrain and dungeons, and run that session, sending me monthly reports to keep the campaign up to date. Those who are interested, write to the... I hope that this campaign will prove to be a melting pot of ideas, sort of a Dungeon Master's Union. Although I may get help the help I need from the 55, I'm planning to expand. So precise, this 55. Providing that I receive the mailing address of the applicant, I will then send an introductory letter to explain the campaign further, and if they are still interested, I will, sit, I will send a supplement to use for the Lurian campaign. I hope that the Lurian campaign will be successful. It's a world of ideas. May your treasures always be plentiful. Look, what a wonderful idea. But in an era when people had to communicate by snail mail, 
pie in the sky. Nerds, such as myself, are unreliable. We think it's a great idea. It's great for a month or two, and then, uh-oh, oh. Can't be bothered this month. And all things fall apart. How many games fall apart after three, or three four, five, six sessions? Because it what seemed like a great idea at the start, suddenly it dawns on you that it's all a little bit of work. But a lot of us are very persistent as well. We're two sides of the coin. If we really get our teeth into it, we can be extremely belligerent and persistent and keep it going. So, Keith, if you're still out there, let us know whether this worked. Because I'm 55. I feel 55 too many. Um, two or three, maybe. Five or six, maybe. But uh, 55. Yeah. Yeah. Dear sirs, allow me to congratulate you on your new magazine as well as to order a copy of The Dragon Number 1. Although I'm not a and d player myself, I still find many of the articles and rules most interesting. However, I begin to wonder where it will all end. My meaning is this, I fear you're going to become bogged down in such a plethora of rules, subclasses, etc. that if all I use, the game could become practically unplayable. Did this letter writer have a crystal ball? Because that describes... Every version of D and D since its creation, apart from I would argue, basic. Even then, a lot of rules appeared in the rules since the rule cyclopedia, and that grew and grew and grew. But you don't have to use everything. That is a simple fact. You do not have to use everything. They're ideas. Anyway, let's keep going. Wonder how many players use more than a tithe of them now. There we go. Overcomplication can be as bad as oversimplification. I think oversimplification is better than overcomplication overcompli nowadays. I'm not saying it should be a game for the lowest common denominator, but it's not impossible to foresee a loss of interest, a bit of arrogance there, um, in it due to it becoming almost incomprehensible. The most successful games are those which do not require one eye, eye on the game and one eye on a rule book. The rules are the most enjoyable. Yeah, there is a point. Um, you've got to get the right balance, and the, the right balance is different for every table. I must, at this point, disagree with the readers who oppose fiction in The Dragon. Frankly, I would like to see much more. I was especially pleased to see Gardner Fox writing for you. I find his heroes to be considerably more original than most of the Conan types most other authors offer us. I missed the first instalment of Gnome Cash, but the author's writing seems to be improving from the second to the third. If he keeps up, he might be another L. Sprague de Camp, who Ernst's writing seems to be resembling more and more. I've never read any uh, L. Sprague de Camp. It was also gratifying to see offering new writers a chance to submit their works. Aside from more fiction and artwork, here are a few things off the top of my head I'd like to see. Articles on medieval tactics both personal combat and full-scale battles. As we know, we got those. Um, book reviews, critiques of various other games, like the article on War of the Empires, reviews and sources of other fantasy magazines, especially the smaller shoestring ones that most of us have never had a chance to find out about, much less see. Um, given the condescending write-up about some of those older mag that those smaller magazines that we got a year or two into Dragons, line, uh, the line of Dragons. Can't see that going too well. Um, an article in the Society for Creative Anachronism would be a, of interest for many readers, I'm sure. Battle reports from dungeon players could be good if worked right and mainly keep the magazine headed in the right direction it seems to be going. Yours truly, Mike Luders. 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 Um, see, we're all different. We all like different things. I really like when I see the new rule suggestions, but I accept the the issue with using them all, and you were never supposed to use them all. It's like with an Earth Arcana. Be selective. It's like with Beck Me. Be selective. 
you don't need all those rules from the companion and masters and immortal set to make a really good game but they're there for you to use should you wish but pick what works for your table um, there's, a, there's a little too much I see in modern D&D sort of newer games at the moment where the DM has to sort of push back against players wanting to add more and more things I don't know how much of it is hyperbole, how much of it is true, but I hear more and more that DMs are having to say yes, otherwise they lose the players. Um, player power. And I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. Suggestions should be assessed and should be talked about, but not accepted blindly. Um, and the DM ha always has the right to veto, to say no. Always. Never forget that. The purpose of the, Dragon Mag of the Dragon is to provide a forum for communication pertaining to fantasy gaming. By fantasy, I include swords and sorcery, science fiction and role-playing, as well as board gaming. See, I don't. Um, fantasy as a genre has an expectation and it's baked into the 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 official dictionary definition of fantasy if there is an assumption of a somewhere around the medieval era in the term fantasy i know there is the other term having a fantasy which can be your, your imagination going anywhere but i don't consider it fantasy if it doesn't have a medieval feel There are, di there are different genres. Science fiction is a different genre to fantasy. I certainly don't recommend that every DM adopt every item that I publish. Correct, Tim. I just publish them so that discriminating DMs can pick and choose as they see fit within the confines and limitations of their campaigns. Correct. The D&D field is sharply polarised between those who feel that every single contingency should be anticipated and rules already laid out and those who prefer to pick and choose the elements of their campaigns. The latter are the ones I consider to be right there, and wing it whenever new alternatives present themselves. Yep. I try to satisfy both of these dissimilar camps as well as those in between the two poles. Well, as we know, I mean, in the late 90s, when 3rd edition came out with its rule-for-everything approach, the that first camp, every single contingency should be anticipated, came to the fore. And we, well, we, we saw some of that happening with things like and Earth Arcana, the survival guides, and then in second edition, there were all manner of kit books, uh, combat and tactics, all that sort of thing. Um, all of which giving, creating more rules and more rules and more rules. And thus, since way back, DM has always had to be selective. The medieval article you desire is more likely to appear in Little Wars, our sister publication. Well, we got some in later, in later Dragons. For instance, check out Volume 1, Number 3 for two fine articles in Crusades Era Gaming. Regarding Out on a Limb, regarding your elf system and the subsequent arguments thereon, this is the way it was working from Lord of the Rings, Guide to Middle-Earth, and the Tolkien Companion, a 531-page Middle-Earth dictionary. Right, okay, is this... Is this <clears throat> okay, I thought this was Paul Sipper again. <laughs> um, okay, they, they, I'm not again. It's a long Middle Earth nerdery article. I like Middle Earth, um, but I'm not going to get into the. Uh, I'm just going to read the last bit. By the end of the Third Age, there were damned few Eldar in Middle Earth. So I think your elf table should be revised to a 20-sided dice, 1 to 16 Sylvan, 17 to 19 Sindar, 20 Noldor. In actuality, there were far less Eldar than even than that even, but the Eldar were more likely to go adventuring than the Sylvan. Okay, happy dragoning, David Michael Friedman. Lord of the Rings, Lorist. Sounds good to me. Any objections out there? No, not for me. There are some long letters here. 
to the average war gamer, regardless of his. Oh, it's supposed to be. It's no more down here. No. There's no dear Ed at the start of this one. To the average war gamer, regardless of his area of interest, the entertainment or pleasurable aspect, as well as the serious side of the subject, is simply a matter of balance. This balance is prejudiced, of course, by the background of the individual war gamer and his personal likes and dislikes. Correct. There is, of course, more to it than that. The average fan, especially the beginner, is generally exposed to three main characters in the wargaming society. First, there is the so-so fan, not a new D&D subclass, who, ha <laughs> who has only marginal interest in the field, but seems to wish equal status, as it were, with all other fans. If you're a player at the table, you have equal status. It's only the DM who is elevated. Attempts by the so-so to oversimplify games and re repeated complaints about the complexity of games and game systems are symptomatic of these persons. Incorrect. In my experience, the older I get, the more experienced I get, the more simple I want the game system. And that's what I tend to see from a lot of other people. A lot of us in our 50s don't want to be going through rule books all the time. I mean, a lot of people I talk to on uh, through my channel, they don't run with all the rules. They wing it. The rules are there to use if you wish, but I find the ones who want to use the, all the rules tend to be relatively new, very eager, wanting to get it right, and wanting to try everything. Once you get older, and more laid back, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rules are there to be ignored, asked around with if necessary, as long as you understand the game. And you're more likely to understand the game with experience. However, their interest, minimal though it may be, should be considered, if possible, accommodated, if for no other reason than to help maintain a broad base and extensive support for all wargaming so as to promote expansion of the war and fantasy gaming field. Well, he's focusing on war gaming, isn't he? And war gaming, if anything, has more nerdery than role-playing games. Courtesy and helpfulness are never misplaced, even or especially to nitpickers. There's a time and a place to nitpick, and sometimes a nitpicker does need to be told to shut up. Do it politely, but shut up. We'll discuss it afterwards. Not during the game, thank you very much. Um, a second character in Wargaming Society is the Fanatic, not a religion subclass. This nut cannot seem to live without wargaming of some type, which in itself is certainly good, but he cannot seem to tolerate anyone who might have a different attitude. You simply should not put someone else down because they don't feel as you do, cockwomble. A fanatic is certainly entitled to his own opinion, but he shouldn't force it down your throat, cockwomble. A fanatic can actually drive wargaming beginners away by being overbearing. The worst possible example is the fanatic DM, who would have, should have a place in the, in the game, D&D, &D, as an evil monster. A DM who makes a newcomer feel welcome, su such as a, mass, as a master mage, Alan Hammock of Birmingham. Not my Birmingham, sadly. Birmingham, the wrong Birmingham, the fake Birmingham in Alabama. My Birmingham's the original Birmingham. Thank you very much. The heart of the Industrial Revolution. It's where it all began, my Birmingham. Not in Alabama. You can make a convert by simply letting them enjoy themselves. But if that's what Alan does, Alan's doing it right. It doesn't matter that he's from fake Birmingham. If he makes newcomers feel welcome then he's doing it right. Because that is part of the job of the DM. We want new people in our hobby. And, yes, we want to teach them to play our way, because we all feel our way is the right way. And we want them to enjoy our games. And if they're not right for our game, hopefully they'll realise that there's plenty of other types of games in the hobby with different types of rule sets, different types of DMs, different types of groups. Every game is different. Not everybody's right for every game, but make people feel welcome to try it out. As long as they behave themselves. Third character met by the newcomer is the money monster. These dudes are so commercially inclined that wargaming fun gets lost in the financial manipulations. 
It should be noted that the founders of modern American war here are the here note. Excuse me. It should be noted here that the founders of modern American war game TSR and Associates have maintained what seems to be a high quality operation, and still have kept their business in a prosperous and expanding state, much to the delight and long-range pleasure of their fans. Without groups such as TSR, the world of wargaming would soon die a slow communications death. How did he go from the commercially inclined to TSR? I mean, yeah, they're a company, yes. But I think he should be talking about the players. Anyway. A final point to be made, that is that for most of us, wargaming is a pleasure, a hobby. Role playing is a pleasure, a hobby. We tend to become very dedicated to it as most of us realise and the impo- as most of us realise and the involvement can be quite serious. A typo. We, the exercise of the body is important as long as, as we have long known. But the exercise of the mind is ju- mind is just as necessary. Correct. Tactical and strategic operations, planning, quick response, development, study of history, and above these, imagination and a liberal dose of mathematics make a superb mental exercise program, healthy for any individual. Absolutely correct. Obviously, wargaming fits that particularly interesting set of parameters exactly. The fact that you can have a ball as well sits as icing. The fact that you can have a ball as well sits as icing on extremely tasty cake. In the final analysis, the beginner should be helped and encouraged for the good of us all. The expert should expand and not allow himself to become bored, either his hobby or fellow hobby person. Either with his hobby or fellow hobby person. The wargaming field is wide open and depends on its individual members, fanatic, expert, beginner or whichever, to expand and grow properly. Therefore, in the immortal words of Commander Spock of the Starship Enterprise, live long and prosper. I think there were more than three categories of, of gamer. Um, but that's a discussion for another another video. So, Gary F. Spiegel, I mostly agree. I mean, I agree with the general tone of what you're saying. There are some things you've said in there which are a bit, yeah, I'm not sure. But I think the general idea of let people come in, try, try the game, um try the various games, find what they like. Look, gatekeeping is important in terms of your own game. You have to gatekeep your own game. Not everybody is right for every game. But for the vast majority of people, there is a game for them somewhere. Yes, yes. Even Power Gaming Munchkins. There's a game for you somewhere. Is that everything? Looks like it. That looks like it. I'm going to skip through because I don't know... um, I don't know if it was restarted anywhere else. Uh, how close are we to the end? We're in the end. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Okay, right. I think that's a slightly more constructive letters page than the first one. A, sl- a little bit less of that. Yeah, you're wrong. Um, but the first letter, of course, was. And there was one, one extremely nerdy letter, which was the Lord of the Rings one. But um, I agree with this suggestion at the end. Uh, dice roll and give them a chance of getting Eldar. Why not? Why not? If it's in the game, as a playable race, there should be a chance of playing it. I think, as long as it fits the world, as long as the player isn't a dick about it. As long as a player doesn't, uh, when they don't roll the 20 to get an Eldar, pack up their bags and go home, or stamp their feet until they get an Eldar. Because there are people like that. We know them. We've seen them. We've all encountered them. Thankfully, not everywhere. But 
there are a few out there, and you know who you are. Anyway, I quite enjoyed that week, too. That's quite a, quite a nice mixture uh, of letters there. I've been the old geek. Hope you enjoyed the video. See ya!